was a little bit longer this week on where God was having me go. And uh, I guess what we're going to be talking about is the Trinity. And uh, this came to me a couple different ways. One was, I um, met a woman this last week. She grew up in the Muslim community. And uh, her dad, she loved her dad, but her dad really um, pushed the Muslim culture on her. And she heard a lot of things about Christians. And as, if there's anything in my heart when I see videos of people talking to Muslims, one of the things that they come up with that they argue with the Christian about is, is the Trinity. Like, how is that supposed to work? It doesn't make any sense. And to be honest, sometimes we don't have great answers or a great perspective, and we're scrambling to answer this. And where we're going with we're trying to move into the freedom of the Spirit and, and, and let Him work in our lives in a new way. We want the power of the Spirit. Part of that journey is we're going to be understanding exactly who is Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit, who is God in a, in a deeper way. And so as we look at this today, um, well, and then I had another situation where I've got in the front of my property, I partnered with the county to, for the bicycle path that's going to go from the pool into town. And I got a lot of old laborers there. And that was one of the questions that even came up this week with one of the gentlemen who was debating with me. If you believe, comes from a different faith background, but they likewise don't believe the, uh, the God, the Father, Son, and Spirit are one thing. And so is this, is this important? Yes. Why does this matter? There's a couple reasons to stand out. Um, first reason would be, Scripture is clear. We need to understand that we have one God. We are not, that's monotheism. It's not polytheism. Poly meaning many. So we have one God. And some of that perspective would say that we have multiple gods. And we, don't, we don't believe that here. We believe that there's one God. And, it, and so like in Genesis 1.26... When you see a verse like this where God says, let us make human beings in our image, the our part is talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and them as a group. Not that there's a bunch of gods hanging out in some courtyard talking about it and God is talking to them. Amen? Amen. So, first part is there's one God. And John 17, 3, even it reiterates this, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, relationship. The only true God, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. Right? So we have, we have, and then the second reason, sorry. So the first reason is we have one God. The second reason is the good news. Jesus' story and the power that makes it the good news is because it's God Himself. If He's just a man, it, it, it doesn't have the same punch. It doesn't mean the same thing. It just means some guy died. But when God Himself, somehow puts himself in a body and comes down and walks with us, talks with us, comforts us. That is the power of God. Emmanuel, right? We're singing about the means of God with us. So this is part of his nature. It's part of who he is. We need to understand this part. The power of the cross is because the perfect one, the mighty one, came to be with us. Amen? So we'll start with... Well, it's one of these conversations when you might be talking to someone and they're, they're trying to articulate this. You're going to find verses that, are, that would argue both sides of this in Scripture. And I'm, I'm stepping out on a limb here because I think we need to, we need to settle this, not necessarily in this church, but in ourselves, um, so that if we have these conversations, we're not caught off guard. And how can we explain this? And here's the problem with this. You have the two sides. You have one side saying, and we're going to look at these verses and say, Jesus is saying, yeah, I'm God. You have a whole list of those verses. But you have these other verses that kind of go the other way. And the risk is, is on both sides I've seen, both arguments, they will end up really stretching stuff to try to make it make sense. And today's point is, I don't think we have to do that. I think modern technology has actually revealed something to us in the spiritual realm. And this is going to be exciting to just wait. It's going to be good. So real quick, let's just look at some verses that say where Jesus is saying, I am God, right? Uh, for John 10, verse 30. It says, the Father and I are one. That seems pretty straightforward. Colossians 2, 9. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Again, pretty straightforward. So, so Jesus and God are the same person. Well, note that we, the same being. How Christianity has talked about it is, is a God had made up of three persons. 
And that's where it gets muddy too. It's like, well, how does this all fit together? We're going to cover this. Um, John 20, 28 says, oh, my Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. So here's a guy who's with Jesus and he understands that Jesus is God. John 8, 58, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. And what he's referring to is Exodus 3.14, when God was in the burning bush talking to Moses, and God replied to Moses, because Moses is going, who are you? He says, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Colossians 1, 15 and 17. Am I going too fast for those who like to make notes? Okay. Um, it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Now, there's a simplicity to this as we're going through this, but God is more complex than this. Each and every one of you believe in a, a, tr a triuneness about you. You believe that you have a soul or a spirit that's going to leave this earthly body, and you're going to find yourself in a heavenly body. Right? That's three pieces right there. Now, this isn't how it works with God, but I, I find it curious that there are some who just reject this. You like the Muslim community, they believe that they're going to die and they're going to get a new body in heaven and a soul is going to transcend. So we have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We have heavenly body, spirit, body on earth. And so we think we've that about ourselves. So if we can have that, why couldn't God, right? In a very simple way, that makes a lot of sense. However, it's a lot more complicated than that. But just to kind of start somewhere with why, why is this even an argument? Something else that's peculiar about these arguments is nobody ever has a problem with the Holy Spirit. Nobody's ever like, well, that's not God. Everybody pretty much agrees, so that's two. <laughs> See, we all agree that it could be God, and God can have his Holy Spirit, but there's not a lot of arguments, very little, that how could God have a Holy Spirit? That doesn't make any sense. There's very little of that argument. But again, why is this a big deal? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and we need to know who he is. We need to be able to stand for him and understand him. Yeah, being. Okay, so Colossians 1 15 through 17, uh, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over creation. Notice it doesn't say he was created first. It says he existed before creation, which also alludes to not saying he just created him. He's God's first created son, you know, something like that. He's supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world, everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. This is talking about Jesus. All right. Well, now we get to a place, though, where we need to talk about the unclear verses because it's not really fair, and we find ourselves in this argument. And uh, I'll be honest, even in my own journey, there was some of this going, I don't know how to make these things connect. Starting with like Matthew 27 and 46. I didn't know how. Um, at about 3 o'clock, this is when the Jesus is on the cross and he's dying. At about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice. A loud voice out there. I wish I could say that properly. I'm not going to try to butcher it. Which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Let's look at that. Like, why? That doesn't make any sense. Right? If Jesus is God, why would he be looking up at the sky going, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's a disconnect there. How do we answer that disconnect? Because these are the verses that you know, come against our faith. Uh, John 5, 19. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. So here again, you got an order to things. It doesn't sound the same. However, there's a connection there. Going well, if God and the Son are the same, it makes sense that they move together. But it has some split there. Uh, John 20, 17. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to my Father. But go find my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. And that's, that was a pretty a gap. How do we close this gap? Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet there is for us only one God, the Father from whom all things, and, and we exist for him. Okay, so we've heard that kind of already, but let's look where it goes. And then one Lord, 
We have one God and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom all things, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. So notice for God it's for him, for Jesus it's through him. But my point is, is we're getting some gaps that we need to try to figure out. How can we close this gap? And does scripture actually give us a way to close this gap without us stretching really hard to create something else, right? And to manifest the whole well. Here's how I explain this. You have to go to a four-week course with me and I'll draw, you know. Can scripture answer this? Um, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind and the man Jesus Christ. And Luke 22, um, 22, 69. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the place of power at God's right hand. Well, if Jesus is God, when he gets to heaven, why isn't he just seated in the throne? Why would he be seated at the right hand? I got you have one more here. In John 14, 28, which says, Remember what I told you, I'm going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really love me, you would be happy that I'm going to the Father who is greater than I am. Okay, amen? So, we need to, we need to settle this even in ourselves so that we're not manipulated, lost, confused, because who Jesus is is the foundation. How can you be in Christ if we don't know exactly where he stands? We don't know exactly who he is. So here's the fun part for today. And this is going to be a little bit different of a message. Hang with me. There's been some revelation through technology. There's things that maybe to humanity haven't made sense. And in my opinion, and this is my opinion, there is some scripture that we look at all the time, but we never take it literal because it never made any sense to take it literal. Like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. But as things have evolved, just like if you tried to explain a cell phone to somebody 400 years ago, or even Jesus' time, you'd be like, well, no, there'd be a day you can hold the thing, you can hold the thing, and you can talk into it, and your dad, who might be in California, can talk right back, and you know, people would think you're crazy, you'd probably get murdered, stoned to death, because... You know, so we know as time it goes on, technology reveals things to us that have been true from the beginning, but we just didn't know. Even things like germs. So you look at scripture where it talks about what to do with a moldy structure. Now, God didn't come down and try to explain germs and mold spores and you, there's things that can kill you that you can't see. He didn't even try to have that conversation. He just gave instruction for you have a moldy house. You do these things. Take this. Yeah, this is what you do. Just do this. So we know that God has been trying to partner with stuff for a long time. As we get into this, though, the main person we're going to be looking at for the conversation is John. And those of you who studied a lot know that John, not John the Baptist John, but the, the uh, disciple John, he was considered Jesus' beloved. And that to me matters because you all have a prior group of friends, and you might have one friend that really gets you. Like you don't even have to say stuff, and they know what you mean. And is it possible that one of the disciples really understood who Jesus said it was, but maybe it didn't make sense to the others because it's his words that we're going to use, and we're just going to look at them literally. Now, the point about revelation through technology, if humanity can do something, don't you think God can do something is kind of where this is going. What I'm, uh, what I'm going to look at is we're going to see humanity is duplicating through, through AI exactly what I think John was saying. So the verses we're looking at is John 1, 1 through 4. And we'll also look at verse 14. So in the beginning, the word already existed. Some of your translations say in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. We know now as he's talking about Jesus. Uh, God created everything through him, everything through Jesus, and nothing was created except through Jesus. The word gave light to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. And we'll fast forward to verse, well, in Genesis 1-3, just to point out this real quick. So what happened in the beginning? We know in the beginning, Genesis 1-3, when God started creating things, he said, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said, and there was. And God said. So we know his words must have power in a way. It doesn't say God made. It doesn't say God built. It says God said. And it was done. So immediately we need to understand there's more to words than maybe we give words credit for. And it's really important the things we speak over ourselves, which is, you know, a part of this message in some way. What are we saying? 
But to his point, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And um, by John 1, 14, I'm going to skip a verse through to you. Um, it says, so the Word became human, the Word became flesh, and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Now, let's take that literal for a second, because this isn't something we would take literal. And I'm going to slow down. I really want you to think about this. What if every word you ever said, every word was recorded, and it could become a person? Just think about that. He said this, and we just kind of skip over it. Like, oh, they had a word. But what if he's being actually a little bit more literal? And the reason I'm, I'm going to say this is we're going to go back through and look at these verses. If we take these things in that context... A lot of these verses make a lot more sense, and there's really not a lot of argument there. Because if, if every word you ever said could be captured and put into a person, who would that person be? And it only could say what you said. What's well, you? Right? And in some ways, we kind of know this thing. I could pull up a video, say Elvis or something, or a song. I could play the song for a minute, and I could go, who was that? You guys go, oh, that's Elvis. And I'm like, no, it's not. He's dead. But what has happened here? His word has been captured, been put into something, but all well, these are just the recording of those things specifically. But if you were to take words and put them into a person, just think how you could interact with that. And my point is, how this came to me anyway, is we're doing this right now with AI. We have that technology. And I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but for those, the scholars that are in our lives that they document a lot of things, I heard one of them say they, the kids went to the AI and they said, hey, write me a letter in the style of so-and-so. And so-and-so -and -so read the letter and he's like, I can't tell this isn't even my own work. Because the computer was so full of his literature and his words. Now, how many of us have like a, any, this was, I was supposed to bring like an Alexis, or what's it called? A, Alexa, yeah. You know, I don't have one. So I just pretend like this is like a little speaker. You know, I was going to use it as a demonstration. But just so that we can pretend we're putting stuff in there. But if you walked up to your Alexa sitting on your counter, if you have one of those, right? And you ask it a question like, even silly questions like, Alexa, what's your favorite food? She will answer. I like as if she has a personality, right? Like, oh, I love chicken and wings from so and so. And they'll ask, like, how are you feeling today? Oh, I'm feeling great. How are you? So we, we're doing this already where we're taking words from a lot of places. We're taking a lot of words from, from all over, and we're sticking it into a, a device, and we're have, able to have conversations with that device. And this is even, there's an AI Bible. The risk of that is, and think about how fun that would be to sit down with a, an AI Bible and be like, well, what do you think about this? And it spits out answers to you. The risk is, you have to, we have to have full trust in whoever put it in there that they just stayed with just what was in the pages and with maybe in all the different translations. But my understanding is it's not been honored that way. It's been compromised with different philosophies and ideologies and other things. So don't go to the internet and ask the AI Bible <laughs> questions. But what if you could protect that and it was perfect? And what if what John is saying, the beginning was the word and God spoke words those words were taken, and they were put into the person of Jesus, into that body. So why was Jesus a flawless son? Why, why could Jesus hold his ground when the rest of human, even though he was in a human suit, why could he hold? Because he knew God's word perfectly. We saw it even when he was being tempted by the devil. The devil's going, go ahead, throw yourself off this cliff. And he starts with, yeah, you know, scripture says, and then the devil comes back with, you know what scripture also says, and then he goes back with, well, the scripture also says, you know, test the Lord. And so you see this, and that changes kind of that story if this would be accurate, that the devil was using Jesus against himself in some regard. Are we doing good? I don't want to say, are you tracking with me? I'm working on that. So. But are we following along okay? And the reason this would be important is if we go back and look at some of these, some of these questions in this framework, just taken John literally, it makes a lot of sense. Why would, let's look at, uh, oh my God, I don't like the order there, sorry. Okay, there we 
Thank you. Uh, John 5.19, put that one back up for a second, would you? So if you were to talk to Alexa and say, well, what can, how, how can you think, Alexa? She would have to say, I can only do what my programmers have told me to do. I've only done what, the, what they can see me doing. Amen? And to, just to know how powerful this technology is, I went on last night, this is the fun part real quick, and I've seen some of the stuff AI can do because not only is AI able to give us responses, AI is now in a place where it can look and sound creative. It can paint and put together pictures that fast. And the thing is, we need to know, it's not a true intelligence, it's all programming. But boy, is it kind of spooky. So I went on, and I tried to find you guys a song, but everybody who's making songs is making inappropriate songs. It seems like everything has stuff in it that don't need to be there. So I went ahead and I downloaded an app called Donna. Donna, you would be like to know the AI app called Donna. And show them the picture of what I put into it. So I typed this in. This is what I took. It asked for the song description. And I said, make a song about a little country church named Saddle Mountain in Colorado, in Crawford, Colorado, and include the words Jesus, praise, singing, country living, fellowship, and victory. In the, the, I picked... Do it in an uplifting mood, in the genre of country, and have the vocals with it. Yeah, so it's got it sings along. Wow. What you're about to hear, we counted it, it took 15 seconds. It made this in 15 seconds. If we tried to make this as a, as a worship team, it would have taken us weeks. And we don't even have all the talent, maybe, to do everything, all the instruments and, okay? So I, I recorded it on the phone. You'll be able to scroll through with the words just in case it's hard to hear. But the voice is made up. That's all I put in. So I put in Colorado, Saddle Mountain, Jesus Praise Singing. And, okay. You guys ready for this? Turn down the lights so that they can hear it okay. See <laughs> you. <laughs>
15 seconds is all it took to make that. <laughs> That's a good point. That's not today's point. No, you know, again, I mean, it had rhythm, it had lyrics, it had ideas. Like, I never even mentioned Savior. And it brought that in. It brought in a whole lot of stuff. So is that the price that we talked about? Not in charge now. I copied it. We think we can play it, maybe. We'll have to figure it out. That'll be our church song. I mean, I thought it was pretty good. What's that? Yeah. So, where was I pointing out with this? Humanity has built the technology where we're gonna we're doing this. And there's gonna come a time if you have enough documentation, let's use Elvis for our illustration. If we had enough documented conversation of what Elvis said and how he thought, and we took all of that and we stuck it in a, a little Alexa looking device, you can have conversation with Elvis. Right? And that's and then if you took that and you see the place the robots are going, you take that device and you put it in the in the software package of a robot, you can have a, a walking, moving, talking Elvis. This sounds like, like that voice, that voice was great. Yeah. How did it do that? Yeah. I don't have a clue. So, sure. what's that? Sure. No? Yeah. no? So, um, what's the point again, leaning back to, I'm trying to paint and give you a, a perspective here that I'm not stretching anything. I mean, if we just look at, at John 1.1 in a literal sense, does it then, answer these questions in, from the other side. Because if it's God's word in something, if all I put it, like we call this the Bible, we're not confused about it going, well, that's, that's, not, that's not God. Like we know it's God's word in this place. This is him that's going to represent him. It's not anybody else. Everybody really knows the Bible. Um, is it possible? And so let's go back and look at some of these unclear verses. So Jesus, Matthew, starting with Matthew 27, uh, where Jesus is crying out, God, God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? If this is his word, and it came down and it's in the body, and it can only do what it says the Father can do, and it's going through this suffering and pain because of what, this is what's fascinating about this part of, of this conversation is, and I'm saying a lot of it's here because I don't know everything. It says we're going to understand Prophesy in part and know in part here. But I'm looking for ways. Is there a way where I don't have to twist scripture and it gives us an answer? And, and modern, is this, I might be, I'm just repeating myself a third. Our modern technology is doing this. So why couldn't God have done this? And if we just take John's thing, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and by verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So why would, why would his word be going, God, God, why have you forsaken me? Why would his word not be sitting in the throne of heaven, but sitting at the right side? His word doesn't, doesn't return to him void. When he says, don't cling to me, I haven't ascended to the Father, uh, who's my God and your God. What is he He's creating an order to things? He's not saying he's not God. But is this, is this yeah. translating well? Um, so, so what implications, and we're going to wrap this up. So what implications does this have for, for what we're looking at, for who, who Christ is? And maybe two things. One is this going to point at God's nature. That we're going to look at Matthew 14, 6 to 11. This is a story of John the Baptist when he died. And what's peculiar about this story is how humanity lets them stuff get wrapped up in things. And this isn't the only story like this. But somebody said something and then when something ugly was coming from it, they didn't pull back. They just pushed it through. And I'm actually curious when we get to heaven, I want to have a conversation with God. Like, how are we supposed to interpret this? Because I would assume it's this is humanity doing what humanity does. But let's, let's look at, let me look, let's look at the verse, the story really quick, and then it'll make more sense. So at a birthday party for Herod, Herodias' daughter performed a dance that greatly pleased him. So he promised with a vow to give her anything she wanted. Here's his words. I'll give you anything you want. He spoke out. I'll give you anything. Um, at a mother's urging, because the mother didn't like John the Baptist, the girl said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a tray. Then the king regretted what he had said because of the vow he made in front of his guests. He issued the necessary orders 
and John was beheaded, beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a tray and given to the girl who took it to her mother. So you have this heinous thing that happened. And uh, why? Because somebody said something. And it compromised things, and so he had to make a decision. First point of, of potential implications that we should think through in, in drawing close to the Lord and how loving he is. From the beginning of time, God has spoke truth. He spoke against sin. He told us, he told us straight up what causes death. And at the moment in history when he sends his son, when he sends his word to come and live with us, just taking John literal, like I'm not stretching, I'm not trying to make a new religion. He sends his word to come and live with us and dwell with us and then die in our hands. Something that was perfect. And, and in this moment, God, God had the option. I'm not trying to compare here what he did with Herod. I'm trying to contrast what he did. Herod didn't back off of his word. And he goes, he had John and he did the hay and his thing. But God, seeing how compromised we were, he sent his word down to walk out salvation for us. That's the nature of our God. He didn't just let us, there. we were compromised. We've been compromised since the beginning in our, in our free will and our flesh. And God took care of us to the place where he took his word and had to suffer. Amen? Amen. Great God. The second part of this would be um, what we pointed out earlier. Maybe we're a little bit too loose with how we use our words. Maybe we don't think through enough how powerful our words are. Matthew 12, 36 tells us, I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. I don't know that we, we are really thinking through enough. When we let our anger get the best of us, or we just let ourselves speak bad, idle words, whether we're talking, I'm so stupid, right? How many of you have done that? I, I've, been, I've been working on this myself. You, you do something, ah, I'm just dumb. Why did I do that? I'm so stupid. Like, we can't say those things. Amen? Like, looking at who God is, that we're made in his image, our words have power. And if we're putting somebody else down, so... We're going to land the player playing here today. Jenny, if you would come up and start to. Uh, we're going to close with the heart of worship because of the heart of things is what we're driving at. I really feel like, and we get affirmation after affirmation, that God is doing something different in, in this place, in your guys' lives, in this community. And I want to be on the front side of this. I don't want to miss. I'm going to encourage you to, if you've not watched Jesus Revolution yet, watch that movie. And just, just look at how God will take a scenario and he just flips something on its head and moves. Amen? I, who wants God to move? Yeah. Amen? Let's all stand and let's worship together to the heart of things. At the end of this life, when we stand before God, we can say, I know you. I know what you did for me. I know how much you love me. I know what you rescued me from. And if anybody asks, well, what kind of a God is this or that? stories we're looking at, we have a very accountable God. He's one who steps in and he intercedes and takes away the consequence, even when we deserve the consequence. So let's, let's worship together. When the music
heart here feels your presence. We can get so wrapped up in verses and debating, but your presence, Lord, changes everything. It eliminates the questions. And so we're asking, we're inviting, we know it's all about you, the person that it is Jesus, and we're asking you to spend time with us, Lord, to grow us, to change us, to change things. There's so many broken hearts and bad situations that you are the truth, the light, the way, the light of the world, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We thank you for this body. In Jesus' name we pray and what people said. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. We'll be getting confident.